Hello everyone, my name is Erzsébet Tócifra, and I'm the Open Science Officer of DARIA. DARIA is a European Research Infrastructure Consortium dedicated to arts and humanities research. And in this video, we are going to have a look at how open access works in the humanities, and what are your options as a humanities scholar to publish your work openly. So, one question I receive quite frequently is whether open access in the humanities is that different um, from that of the hard sciences? And I would say the answer is both yes and no. No, because of course it operates along the very same values of democratizing access to knowledge by leveraging on present day technology. So working, usually working with uh, artifacts that belong to our co collective cultural memory, uh, we humanity scholars are very well aware that knowledge is not an exclusive property of academics working in ivory towers. But on the other hand, there are certain community practices in the humanities in terms of language diversity, in terms of publication formats, in terms of um, complexities with licensing and intellectual property, uh, but also in terms of funding models that define our priorities and directions for future innovation. So importantly, um, the pay to publish models that shift the publication cost from the readers to the authors um, will not work very well in disciplines when um, there is not a huge amount of external grant funding money available. And this reminds us uh, to something very important about open access. That is, it does not and it should not be equated with author fees, um, especially um, in response to this special needs of humanity scholars. Um, we see more equitable uh, forms of open access publication beginning to emerge. Um, some of them are based on uh, library consortial funding, such as the Open Library of Humanities, probably uh, the most famous, most well-known instance of uh, open access publishing in humanities, or they are based on crowdsourcing, or freemium models like the open edition. Um, but the commonality in all these emerging no author fee publication models is that um, uh, libraries or institutions or ministries or other funding agencies make collective investment in the publication infrastructure itself instead of simply uh, paying for the publication costs to big publishers. Um, in the resource list below, uh, you will find uh, many of these uh, uh, providers who produce high quality peer review, open access works, and in many cases also advocacy to help you uh, to operate in a fairer, in a more fair publication environment. But also these innovations show us something very important about the beauty of open access and digital publishing. That is, uh, gaining a broader readership is probably not the only uh, favor open access does to humanity scholars, uh, but it also enables us to leverage on uh, the available advanced technologies to open up a much bigger and much wider part of our research processes than just the sum of our conclusions. For instance, uh, by linking back uh, to your primary resources, you can clearly indicate where these sources end and where your interpretation or annotations or enrichment starts. Where are the uncertainties in your material? But open access also al allows you to open up your manuscript or book to open annotations, allowing others to contribute to your work. Uh, you can also add multimedia, 3D visualizations, interactive maps, um, 
complementary material that you could not fit into the print version or a collection of musical notations, you can link your data. Uh, basically, you can add anything you work with to open a much bigger window on the phenomenon you are passionate about. Some of uh, the bolder experiments, the bolder instances, uh, uh, experimenting with the life of scholarly monograph in this digital age really pushes the boundaries of uh, what we conceive of as a monograph uh, these days. They result in living scholarship uh, that is developing even after publication. So I collected uh, my favorite instances to you in the resource list uh, to explore and play around with them. And now you may ask, okay, but how all this innovation align with the more traditional digital formats, or even uh, whether they signal the death of the good old print books that fill the bookshelf behind me? I don't think so, and I'm certainly not alone with this view. Um, Repeated studies that you will find uh, done in the research list show that um, open access does not affect um, print sales, or not negatively, at least. Uh, on the other hand, um, it's still very important to us to have something tangible in our hands to complement open access, the digital open access versions with uh, print on demand. Um, books. Um, we interact with the scholarly monograph in different ways, but in both ways. So supporting the many routes that are leading uh, to the open monograph in terms of formats, in terms of scope, size and scale, but also in terms of uh, funding availabilities and languages uh, is vital uh, if we want to have open access a reality in such a diverse and multicolored collection of research communities that we find in the arts and humanities. Speaking of realities, uh, we still uh, have a plenty of things to do. Um, probably the biggest challenge to the open monograph currently is that research evaluation is lingering in a vicious circle. That is, um, open access and all the innovations it brings to the table are currently counter-incentivized in many of the um, research evaluation criteria that are based on publishers' prestige. That is, the more established formats, the more traditional formats um, with a high prestige big publisher still count more, much more in academia than the innovations I mentioned before. Um, the digital critical editions, uh, a very valuable and important uh, scholarly uh, content type in the humanities, um, is a very good example for this alternative forms of scholarly communication that doesn't yet fit um, into the current evaluation system. And as long as this is the case, as long as um, the assessment of research excellence is basically outsourced um, to the publishers, um, these innovations will not grow sufficiently enough to reach a critical mass uh, on the basis of which um, we could establish an alternative proxy uh, that could replace the current harmful system. So there is an urgent need to reassess and reach a broad consensus about what the scholarly monograph is in the 21st century. Um, and based on this consensus, uh, we need to reach, we need to get uh, a new social contract between researchers, publishers, their institutions, and also between research infrastructures. And this is what we contribute to in my organization, Daria. So we are working as a research infrastructure to bring the arts and humanities communities forward, a community whose specific needs are often get left out from the discussions about the future of scholarly communication. 
we believe that open science works best when it's deeply entrenched in the different uh, research community practices. So our mission is to uh, is, is to build bridges between uh, the core values and principles of open science, such as transparency, equality, cognitive justice and knowledge creation, and the everyday research practices of a wide variety of arts and humanities disciplines. Um, we never really had this wealth of networks and uh, tools and possibilities for collaboration at our fingertips. So let's use them. What kind of scholarship I want to be a part of? What are my expectations towards a book, both as an author and as an editor? Uh, how I want my readers to interact with my scholarship? And how do currently available publication options and the policy landscape help me or impede me in doing so? Uh, how about the independent life of my book, how its long-term availability will be guaranteed and how it will find its way uh, to the audience? Um, thinking through these questions will take us much closer to find the publication setting that fits best to our research. Um, if you're looking for this, uh, I will recommend you to First, check out what is available for you locally. Visit your subject librarian. Librarians are quite strong allies of us anyway. Uh, and figure out together uh, whether there are publication grants, uh, membership options or special publication outlets available for your institution. University presses are increasingly producing high quality peer-reviewed open access monographs, in many cases with no fees uh, for the authors of their institutions. But even if you don't have such open possibilities available, uh, you can browse the biggest collection of open access books, the, D the directory of open access books, DOAB, uh, to learn more about um, open monographs and available providers. Um, on the other hand, um, we are well aware that having your first monograph uh, published open access is not an easy thing to do in the current research evaluation climate. Uh, some might even say that it's a little bit of uh, mission impossible and we should not close our eyes over this. But I find it really important uh, for you to be aware that even if you publish at a non-open publisher, uh, you almost always still have the option to share at least some version of your work openly via self-archiving. Sometimes it only takes a question to your publisher, for instance, by pointing out your funder's requirements. But even more importantly to this, I want you to be aware that being an open scholar is not something black and white. There are many shades, there are many flavors, uh, there are many modes to be an open scholar. Keep exploring them to learn which ones work the best for you, because after all, it's about your work, your scholarship, and your ideas that are important and deserve to be open.